welcome to your final exam review. Uh, this is going to be a, a relatively brief overview of kind of what's going to be on the final exam. I'm going to do a few examples, kind of give you a list of topics as you can see on the screen right now. I want to just kind of start off kind of going through some of them, kind of illustrating what the, the example looks like and kind of show you when we get there. Um, number one is angle measurements, right? We talked about going from degrees to radians, radians to degrees, degrees, minutes, seconds, all these kinds of situations. For now, go from radians to degrees. If I want degrees in my answer, I want to make sure to multiply my original radian measure by 180 degrees over pi. If I'm going to go from degrees back to radians, I want radians my final answer, we're going to multiply the actual degree measure by pi over 180, and we'll simplify those fractions. Uh, always keep them in fractional form. You know that radians always have uh, something pi over something. Uh, so keep that idea, especially uh, on a multiple choice test. You really don't have a lot of freedom with your answer uh, choices. Number two, we have degrees, two degrees, minutes, and seconds. And then, of course, back from degrees, minutes, seconds, back to degrees. Let's talk about the first one. If I start out with a degree that is a decimal form, then we have... Um, we take the decimal piece of this, and we're going to multiply that decimal by 60. That's going to give us another whole number with a decimal. The whole number part of that answer is your number of minutes. You take that decimal piece next, and you multiply by 60 again. Okay, At that point, it's going to give you your full uh, number of seconds. I'm going to round this number in a, in a traditional sense. So if it's 0.6, I'm going to round it up. Since if it was 0.5 or more, I'd round up. If it was 0.4, I'd round down. And so here we have 210 degrees, 7 minutes, and 25 seconds. And that's how you go from degrees to degrees, minutes, seconds. To go from degrees, minutes, seconds back to degrees, we're going to take a, a, an angle measurement that has a number of degrees, minutes, and seconds. And we're just going to really type this into a calculator using this method. Really, you'll fill in the first piece with the degrees. The top of this fraction is going to be your minutes, and the top of this fraction is going to be your seconds. Um, the 60 and 3600, that is part of the equation. That won't ever change. Type it all in, and you're going to get a solution that will be a number of decimal places. And, of course, look at your answer choices on a multiple choice test to determine how far you should go and where you should round. I think the answer at that point would be pretty obvious. Number four, arc length. When we want to do arc length, we had to use the formula S equals R theta. The only thing we had to remember was that theta must be in radians. Uh, in previous examples, we've done things like with a circle with a radius of 10 and an angle of 30 degrees, what is the arc length? And you know, if you do three, you know, 10 times 30, 300, that would be wrong because I used 30 degrees. I should be using pi over 6 times 10. Um, that's going to get me 10 pi over 6 or 5 pi over 3, whichever. Um, and that would be the correct answer for this thing. So be careful. Make sure you put the angle measurement in radians first and then multiply through. Uh, coterminal angles, here we had uh, where we added or subtracted 360 if it was degrees. It added or subtracted 2 pi to whatever the original angle was, and that would give you um, radians. Be careful. Sometimes we ask you for a positive and a negative coterminal angle. Sometimes if you started with something like this, um, if I, so let's say it was 1,021, then I would have to subtract 360 a number of times before I got it to be a negative angle measurement. So just be aware of that. Number six. Right triangle trigonometry. This is where we had Sokotoa, uh, right triangles, opposite adjacent hypotenuses. Uh, we had the Pythagorean theorem. I'm really not going to go over this very much because I think this was pretty much uh, something that most people had a pretty good grasp on from the beginning. Um, but we solved triangles, found sides and angle measures using inverse trig functions and regular trig functions, as well as the Pythagorean theorem. So make sure you check out that. And most of these were on, on your first, first test. Uh, the last part of that first test was the unit circle, where we went in and we learned the elements of the unit circle. Um, the unit circle, I'm not going to ask you to, to write it out, but you will need it for things like the right triangle trig. Uh, you'll also need it for things like sum and difference, um, and possibly even down into double and half angle. Your next major topic is graphing trig functions. There were four elements in, times, in terms of graphing trig functions. We had to remember we had amplitude, period, phase shift, and vertical shift. If we had a uh, generic trig function, 
uh, it looks like this. Of course, this could be any sine, cosine, or tangent, uh, or any of the other three. Uh, this is what you always looked at. Always remember that the H here, which is representative of our horizontal shift, that was always going to be the uh, opposite sign of whatever you had to start with. So when you get in here, you're going to look at A. The absolute value of A is going to be your amplitude. Remember that sine and cosine only have amplitude. Period is going to be 2 pi divided by B uh, for sine, cosine, secant, and cosecant. But it was pi over B for tangent and cotangent. Phase shift was just the H over B, but remember the H part, be careful to switch that sign. Right? If it's minus H, that's going to be a positive H. If it's negative H or if it's plus H, you're going to have a negative H. Uh, and vertical shift was always just whatever your K value was, just like it looks. The next part, simplify and verify. I'll get to that in just a minute. Some differences. Uh, this is where we had uh, things like sine. Uh, we had like sine of 105, where we had to come up with two angles, something like this, sine of 60 plus 45, to go ahead and work that out and plug that into my formula, which will be on your formula sheet, and use my unit circle to finish that out. The double and half angle identities we had kind of like something like this. If you had a cosine of 3 fifths, they told you that theta was in somewhere between 0 and 90 degrees, and then they wanted you to find sine of theta over 2. I had to remember the formula, which we had on the formula sheets, and then I had to basically figure out what the cosine of theta was, which this was nice, they gave it to me. But if I didn't have it, I would draw the triangle in the correct quadrant. This one's from 0 to 90, so that's first quadrant. I'm going to plug it in right here, and then I'm going to plug it into this equation and basically work my way down through it and finish it out using just the basic algebra. And that's what you get here. Of course, I'm just working to run, <coughs> working all the way down, simplifying as far as I possibly can because my answer choices are gonna have that pretty much simplified. Of course, you can stop at some point and type it into your calculator and get a decimal. You can kind of try to match that decimal with the ones in the in answers. Um, be careful about that. You'll make a mistake if it's complicated. Uh, the other pieces here we had uh, law of sines and cosines. Uh, this was kind of self-explanatory. This is the one that's most recent. We spent the most time on this recently. Um, using the formulas to find the sides, angles, or solving a triangle, or even finding the area of, of triangles. Here are a few examples of the simplify and verify. These are actually from the test that we gave from sections 5.1 to 5.2. Um, I'm just going to kind of refresh your memory on the different steps that we like to take. Uh, number one, uh, remember when you're given something like this, changing things into sine and cosine is always a, a good start to the, the process. Convert tangent into sine over cosine, you get the cosines to cancel out leaving with just sine. When you have something like uh, a binomial, uh, especially when it's the difference of two squares. Uh, when you multiply these things together, you are definitely going to get some kind of uh, probably a Pythagorean identity. So remembering your Pythagorean identities when you have a squared function is always a good thing to look for. Um, when you have fractions and you're kind of bringing things together, uh, multiplying by the opposite denominator and getting a common denominator this way is usually an, a really easy thing to do. Uh, when you multiply an, a trig function times its inverse, you always get 1. So we end up getting 1 minus sine squared all over sine times cosine. Here again, this is a Pythagorean identity, which gives us cosine squared. One of the cosines from the top cancels with one of the bottom, leaving you with cosine <coughs> over sine to get cotangent. Uh, and the same thing happens again in problem number 4. You get a sine-cosine change for both of the bottom pieces. You get some simplifying, you multiply by the reciprocal, and it gives you sine squared. Uh, I would definitely take some time and look over the, uh, if you don't have it, the test, then you can look over some of the review guides, go all the way back. You, uh, the detailed review guides, even the tutorials are still available. Go back and check some of these things out. I'm not gonna put the hardest things on there, but um, all things like this are, are definitely possible. So give the simplify and verify questions a good run. Uh, make sure you go back over those 11 original identities. Those are the ones that I need to have the most knowledge of so that you can make these things kind of easy to kind of come by. 
The last thing we're going to kind of hit is solving trigonometric equations. This is kind of a, a harder version of, of some of those things. Um, this is the ones where you had the cosine of 2 theta. So the hard part about this is that you had a 2 theta here, and i got to get rid of the 2 theta before I can move on. And so what we did was we said, well, cosine of 2 theta was equal to three different things from my formula sheet. Um, the rule was I want to pick the one that keeps it in the same trig function as the equation. Since this already has a cosine involved, right, so it's the same function as cosine, and so I'm going to pick the middle one here and replace the cosine of 2 theta with this expression here. <clears throat> when you have three terms, especially one with a squared function, like a quadratic, I'm going to make sure to get everything on one side of the equation. So we're going to add cosine theta to both sides. You get this equation. I want to factor this equation like a traditional factoring problem. And so we end up with 2 cosine times cosine to give me co 2 cosine squared. Uh, and then the negative one would be a positive one and a negative one. To make sure I've got the signs right, I'm going to multiply the outside and the inside terms to make sure that they add up to the exact same thing that I had originally in the middle term. If I do, then I'm right. If I've got it wrong, then I need to switch the signs and try it again and make sure I do get the same thing. Usually, that's going to happen, right? You'll get the opposite sign or the correct sign. Just be careful. At this stage, I'm going to take each piece here and set it equal to zero. Sometimes this works out where you have a greatest common factor if there's only two terms instead of three. A lot of times you'll factor out some of those great co greatest common factor and then you'll set them equal like this. Um, kind of just depends on what's going on. Here, you have two factors. I'm going to solve each factor, so we end up here adding 1 divided by 2 to get cosine theta equals 1 half and cosine theta equals negative 1. Now, you can use your calculator. Cosine inverse uh, of these values will get you an answer, not all the answers. Um, the, the best way to do this is to go back to the unit circle. Remember that cosine is the x-coordinate and that sine is the y-coordinate. So I'm going to kind of take this. Where is x equals negative 1 on the unit circle? If you think about that, the only place x is negative 1 here is 180. So the only answer here is 180. Cosine of 1 half. Well, cos cosine is equal to 1 half in two separate locations. Uh, it's equal to it here at 60 degrees, and then here at th uh, 300. The way I did this one, I didn't really use the unit circle. I drew out the triangle. I knew that it was positive. Uh, all students take classes. All of them are here, and cosine is here for positive angles, right? Sine is here for positive, and tangent is positive here. And so <clears throat> I drew triangles here. I labeled the adjacent over the hypotenuse, all right? So put the one here and the two up top. I knew that this was a 30, 60, 90 triangle because I ended up having to get the square root of 3 on this side, and 1, square root of 3, and 2 breaks out it to be a 6, 30, 60, 90 triangle. The square root of 3 is across from the 60 degree angle, and of course the 1 is across from the 30. So I knew that this angle has to be 60, which this is also going to be 60, but I don't want the negative angle measurement here. So if I go all the way around, um, 360 minus 60 would be just 300. So all three of these would be the final solution to this question. So there's three answers to that. And, of course, there's much easier questions like that that you can kind of start here and solve it um, using the unit circle, uh, maybe even a trig inverse function. Um, but if you had to come back and factor like this, then this is kind of how you go through it, and then you get back into it that way. This is on uh, the test for 5, 3 to 5, 4. I think we had some really basic one of these. Uh, maybe on the very first test. So that was like 4-1 to 4-3. Anyway, check these out. Make sure you get a, give those a good run. And <clears throat> I think that really covers m the majority of the topics are going to be on the benchmark. Uh, I recommend going back over your old tests and using the review guide. Uh, email me if you have any questions. Of course, don't forget you have all the resources that we've been given out all semester. Uh, all those tutorials, all the review guides, all the solutions and keys are all present for you guys to use. So uh, you have an extreme amount of resources that you can be using. Take, for, take that for what it's worth and make sure that you are prepared for tomorrow's test. It will consist of 40 multiple choice questions and you'll have an hour and a half, 90 minutes to complete that test. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.